I'm really glad you're here. One of the things I want to say is our, our topic uh, for this week and next week is family systems and thinking about how family systems work. And that topic in and of itself can be a little complex. It can be a little theoretical at times. And mostly what I want you to know about me is I'm a practitioner. And so I'm going to come at this from a really practical way. Uh, one of the things I want to say to you is that the only person that any of us can change is ourselves. So we can change ourselves. And it's through our change of ourselves that the systems we're in, we are in get changed. So whether that, that's my family or whether that's the place I work or whether that's my local congregation that I attend or whether it's the community neighborhood group, the only way I'm going to impact that group is when I change myself. And so we're going to talk about that today. I also want to begin with this idea. So Family systems is about growing in our own emotional maturity. And I have a little formula that I, that I work off of, that emotional maturity. Uh, uh, and before I get there, let me say this. And emotional maturity is our ability to maintain relationships without blowing them up with our reactivity. And so emotional maturity looks like this. It's being self-regulated plus being self-defined equals emotional maturity. And over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about both those topics. So today, I'm going to be talking about becoming more self-regulated. Because the more we become self-regulated, the more it's an indicator of our emotional maturity, and the healthier our relationships will be. So I have a PowerPoint I'm going to run through, and the way I like to do this group is I, I, I'm going to go through a, a few slides, and then I'm going to uh, let you see me again, because again, I like, uh, I like you to see me and not just get lost. Do any of you have relationships that are less than what you hope they would be? And I already know the answer to that, because we all do. We all have relationships that are less than what we hope they would be. And what I want to uh, suggest to you is that the reason our relationships and that we have relationships that are less than we hope they would be is because of our, of our reactivity to the anxiety that emerges in our lives. And that's why we that's why we have relationships that are not as good or not as healthy as as we want them to be. Uh, a second question that I'd ask you is, do you ever react to people in ways that you later regret? Uh, again, it's uh, it, it's a question that I know already the answer to. And the answer is yes. Because we all do. We, we all react to people in ways that we later regret. And often, and in fact, most of the time, we have no clue why we're reacting in the way we're reacting or uh, uh, of how our own anxiety is impacting us or how our own anxiety is impacting the systems that, that we're a part of. And so I want to tell you a story uh, that I'll tell you the rest of the story at, at the end of the day. Uh, both, both my adult daughters, I told you they're school teachers and they live here in the greater Houston area. And both of them are graduates of Texas A&M University up in College Station. And uh, I'm a huge football fan and just love football. And so when my oldest was going through school, we decided to become season ticket holders to Texas A&M football games. So on game weekends during the fall, we are at A&M, we're going to games. And one of the things that I know about myself is that on game day, I get highly anxious. And as I reflect on my own anxiety, I, I wanted to, I'm not anxious about the outcome of the game. 
because that's going to that's going to be taken care of on the field by the players. What I'm anxious about is I'm really anxious about getting from I live up here in Tomball, so from Tomball up to College Station and not getting caught in traffic anywhere, not getting caught in the narrow down from Highway 290 when it narrows down to Highway 6 and and it drops from uh, you know, two lanes down to one lane. And I get anxious about the 103,000 people that are going to gather to go to the football game and all the tailgating that goes on. And I just get anxious because I want to get there. I want to get my seat. And, and the bottom line is because I want what I want on game day and what I want on game day is I want to be able to see the game and be there and so anything that delays us or gets in the way of us getting there on time makes me really really anxious so a number of years ago um, both my daughters were going to the game with us and they were driving to our house uh, here in Tomball to go up to the game and one of my daughters called me on the phone frantic almost in tears because she had gotten stuck on uh, in traffic on 290 when they were doing all the construction over on 290 and she was all anxious herself because she knew daddy was going to be upset with her for being late because if we don't do it just in the time frame that it's supposed to be done in what daddy does is daddy reacts in ways that he later regrets he acts like a jerk. He says things he shouldn't say. He grumbles and complains, and he is irritable, and he's snarky. And what I recognized was that my anxiety was running through the whole family. And so I could see it in this one daughter, and then I began to think, well, yeah, and, and then that impacts my wife, and th that impacts my other daughter, and, and eventually our day uh, gets messed up, or it gets ruined, or at least I behave really badly, because I want what I want, and I'm not getting what I want, or I think, uh, or what I want is being threatened. And so what I learned in that moment is how anxiety and my own reactivity to anxiety impacts the system that I'm in. So anxiety is contagious. We, we don't really understand it. We don't know how it works. We don't know when it works, but it does. And so I, I want to say to you that we live in a world that's highly reactive. Uh, it's, I mean, we can see it everywhere. We can see it on the nightly news. We can see it with road rage incidents. And in fact, this picture uh, is a picture of, uh, of two sets of people that uh, reacted to one another on the road here in, in the greater Houston area, and they reacted with conflict and violence. And I just want you to think about how often in life, life is about reacting to circumstances around us rather than clearly living by the guiding principles that we have for our own life. And that reactivity at its root, underneath it all, stems from our anxiety. So people are highly anxious today, and as a result of their high level of anxiety, they react in ways, sometimes with conflict, sometimes with other ways. So Harriet Lerner said it, and many others have said it, uh, anxiety is extremely contagious, but so is calm. And you and I have a choice. We can react out of our anxiety in typical ways and in ways that we'll later regret, or we can respond based on our best thinking and with calmness. And when we respond in calmness, we can change the entire systems that we're in. So, couple of things I want you to get real clearly. Number one, anxiety is contagious. And when one person in a family, in an organization, or in a group gets anxious, their anxiety gets received and taken on 
by eventually the entire group. But if I can manage my own anxiety, and if I can still myself, and if I can get my thinking going again, then I can, I can be calm in the midst of others' anxiety, and my calmness is also contagious. One of the things that uh, I've learned along the way, and, and I realize in my own life, and I, I love to say it this way because it, it's just so blunt and so plain, anxiety makes us stupid. And we behave in stupid ways and we do stupid things. And the reason it, it does is because anxiety means that underlying that there's a sense of threat of some sort. It might be a real threat or it might be an imagined or made up threat, but there's a sense of threat. And when that sense of threat happens, our bodies react to that and all the good thinking parts of our brain shut down and we go into that reptilian part of our brain that's just reacting. And so when we're in reactive mode, that reactivity is contagious. But I don't have to stay stupid. I don't have to stay anxious. I don't have to continue behaving in the ways that I later regret, but I also can manage my way into calmness. And so one of the key ideas that I want to present to you today and help you get is this, becoming more self-regulated is an indicator of emotional maturity. And self-regulation is about, I'm learning to take responsibility for myself and only myself, and I'm learning to see anxiety when it emerges, and I'm learning to manage that anxiety and that reactivity in much more healthy ways. So anxiety impacts systems, but my calmness will impact the system, and the more I can regulate myself, the more emotional maturity I bring to any system and the healthier that system becomes. Dr. Henry Cloud, uh, the author of the book Boundaries and a, and a psychologist, uh, said it this way. He said, external conflicts are difficult to resolve before resolving the internal conflicts that fuel them. My interpretation of what he's saying there is, is that yeah, we react to anxiety and we're, we're engaged in external conflicts, but that reactivity is fueled by something deep within ourselves. It's fueled by some wound that I have or something that I'm protecting myself from. And if I don't address the internal conflicts, then I'm going, not going to have much success in addressing the external conflicts that come because of that. The way I like to say it uh, is we all learned ways of protecting ourselves in our first formation. And that word first formation uh, for me means the first 17 years of our life. When we're at home, uh, going to school, uh, that was our first formation. And by the way, we all get formed. Uh, we get formed by multiple influences. But in our first formation, we, we learned that, okay, in order to be safe, this is what I have to do. Or in order to get what I want and get my needs met, this is what I have to do. And it's in our subconscious and we're not even aware of it. 99% of the time, we're not aware of the ways we're protecting ourselves. But what happens in life then is we interact with people, we rub shoulders with people along the way, and as we do, those old wounds get stirred up and our ways of protecting ourselves show up, and we behave in ways we regret because ultimately we are trying to protect ourselves. A couple of things there. Typically, that's not in my awareness. I don't even know what those things are. And so what I want to suggest to you is if we're going to become more self-regulated, one of the very first things we have to do is we have to learn, okay, in what ways am I protecting myself and what am I protecting myself from? So let me give you an example. Back to my story with getting highly anxious on game days. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, from about the time I was nine on, I was my dad's helper. 
My dad owned his own construction business and we lived out in the country. And so Saturdays were always days where we were, we were either mowing the grass or we were working on equipment or we were doing something. But most all of my Saturdays were, were done doing work and I didn't get to do what I wanted to do. And so the, one of the reasons why I get so anxious on game day is because I have a need that, that didn't get met in the way I wanted it met when I was a kid. And so there's this wound in me of, by golly, as an adult, I'm going to get what I want on Saturdays. I'm going to get whatever it is. And for me, that means going to the football game. And so I, I want you to see just in a little way that we all learned ways of protecting ourselves. And those ways of protecting ourselves were appropriate for a nine or a 10 year old child, but they're not a, an appropriate for an adult. Uh, and, and yet by default, we continue to behave in the same old ways because we're protecting ourselves from getting wounded again like we were wounded as children. And so one of the things in self-regulation is those wounds or that way of protecting ourselves become emotional triggers for us. And, and we learned ways of being and reacting. And when we get triggered, we react in those same old ways. And, and so what I want to invite you to think about is this idea that growing in our awareness that we get triggered, growing in our awareness of how we behave when we get triggered, and growing in our awareness that we're being triggered is a part of being self-regulated, and it's a part of us learning to become more emotionally mature. So people typically react to anxiety in, in, in four typical ways. And what I've discovered in my own life is I react in all of these ways. It just depends on the relationship and it depends on my role in the relationship. So when I'm kind of the leader, conflict is my choice. And conflict is not, not necessarily just physical. It's also uh, uh, verbal. And so what I do when I get anxious and what I learned as the way to protect myself, and by the way, I learned this because this is the way my father protected himself, is I learned to verbally attack. And so when I get anxious and I'm kind of in the leader role, I verbally attack when I get anxious. A second form uh, of uh, way we typically react to anxiety is by distancing. And that's by withdrawing emotionally, closing up inside. So when I'm not the leader, that's my go-to. Because when I was a little nine-year-old kid, my dad would lash out at me verbally when he got anxious and when his anxiety overwhelmed him. And so what I learned was to be like a turtle and close myself in and, and go within uh, my hard shell and, and just say, well, I'm tough enough to take whatever whatever he has. And what it ends up doing is then I distance in relationships and I lose intimacy because I've shut off internally. A third way of uh, reacting to anxiety is by over and under functioning. And those are reciprocal. So whenever there's an over functioner, there will always be an under functioner. And, and by the way, often in relationships, we'll, we'll flip hats on that. So I'll overfunction sometime and then I'll underfunction sometime. And over and under functioning means I do more than my share. I do more than what's required. Or I, 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 so in my marriage, I'm an overfunctioner. So when my wife gets anxious and I know she's anxious and irritated or whatever, man, I do everything in my power to get her to where she feels good about me again. So I, I, I overfunction. I do for her what she can do for herself. And I allow her to underfunction uh, because I'm doing it out of anxiety and I'm doing it as a way to protect myself. And then the fourth way is by triangling. And that's where we go talk to another person about whatever problems we have. Instead of dealing with the people we need to be dealing with, we simply talk about them behind their backs uh, and, and we offload our anxiety on them in those places. So uh, 
So that's the four ways we react to anxiety. And then the ultimate form of distancing is, is what we call cutoff. And cutoff is simply when we, when we quit the relationship. When we say, okay, or we quit the job or, or, we, or we quit whatever. And we just say, you know what? There's too much stress. There's too much anxiety. I can't take it anymore. And so I'm just going to quit and, and, and give up. And that's cut off. And often we do that. So I want to invite you uh, with this picture. I, I, I want to give you a little analogy that is related to all this. So I want you to imagine that something happened, you had a little accident, and somehow you, you got just a little sliver of glass in your shoulder. And, you, you know, it hurt and it bled a little bit and you thought you'd fixed it and you put some, some uh, Band-Aid on it and, and you went on about your business and the skin healed over, but that little piece of glass is still in your shoulder. And one day you go to work or, or you, you go to an event and, and there's a crowd of people and you accidentally, someone accidentally bumps into you and hits that shoulder that has just that little tiny little piece of glass in you. But when they bump your shoulder, that little piece of glass cuts you afresh. And oh my goodness, it hurts and you grab it. Think about how you react when your shoulder gets bumped. Most of us react by saying, uh, by, uh, we might react with conflict by, by jumping all over the person and, and verbally attacking them. We might react with distancing by saying, oh, it hurt, and then we withdraw and just kind of shut down. Uh, we might react by overfunctioning and saying, oh, my gosh, we, we've got we've to somehow reorganize the room so that this never happens again. My point in that is this. When our shoulder gets bumped, we blame the other person for hurting us. But the reality is we're responsible. And we're responsible because, you know what, I've got a, piece of, a little piece of glass in my shoulder and I need to go have it removed. I need to have it taken care of. It's really not the other person's fault. They accidentally bumped into me. I'm responsible for leaving a little piece of glass in my shoulder and allowing that to hurt me. Well, when, it, when it's a physical wound, we know what to do about physical wounds. We don't know much about what to do with emotional wounds. And so what I want to suggest to you is one of the ways that we self-regulate is we grow in our awareness of what our wounding is, that little shard of glass, and we take responsibility for it. And we recognize, you know what? I've got a way of protecting myself. This is what it is. And I need to take responsibility for finding a way to gain healing around whatever that wounding is so that I can show up more as an emotionally mature adult rather than an emotionally immature child in the way that I'm reacting. And that's what self-regulation is.